Things just turned half four, so um, very welcome um, to the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society um, meeting. Um, this evening we've got the Barrington Medal um, lecture, and we're uh, really delighted that the um, recipient Paul Kilgariff is with us from live from Galway today. Paul is working with uh, Glenn Vey, but is also um, with the Luxembourg Institute for Economic and Social Research. I may have got that right or wrong, Paul, but you'll be too kind not to correct me. <laughs> um, but just to say congratulations and a particularly um, significant topic in the housing market and the characteristics of the housing market. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to you, Paul, and we look forward to hearing your Barrington um, lecture. The Honorary Secretary, Ronan Lyons, I'm not sure you've been acquainted with the, the minutes yet, so if, if not, we'll go straight to the paper. Okay, Paul, you're up. Okay, thanks, Danny. So I'll just share my slides. Okay, so everyone can see those? Yep, can see those. Yep. Okay, great. So um, I'm delighted to, and it's an honour to receive the prize, and um, I'd like to thank the the Statistical and Social Inquiry for the awarding of that this topic is deemed worthy of the um, to give the lecture. So um, I'm going to look at price, size and density. So Dublin housing with an EU context flavour. Um, so I'm currently working as an economic researcher with Glyn V and I'm also an external research affiliate with Lizer where I would have carried out this work. So um, an outline of the presentation. So I'm going to talk about residential choice and the factors in deciding where to live, why house size is important in that, and then some analysis and results to examine affordability, density of Dublin with comparison with some European cities, and then um, a piece I've added on viability issues and potential supply issues that are currently in the system. And then some conclusions then um, introduce why a measure of price per meter squared is important, policy recommendations and what we want our future of our cities, Irish cities to look like in a post-pandemic world. So um, just a brief overview of um, where this presentation I suppose is set in terms of urban economics. So um, it would have started with uh, Herman von Thunen and his model of agricultural production and land use, where um, producers um, situated in an area to maximize their profits. Um, Alonzo Mills Muth then adapted this model to look at and use it to um, value land in terms of residential prices and bintering curves. And the idea is that a person um, trades off their income with commuting costs and housing costs in a way that will maximise their utility. Um, so this is based on the idea that cities are monocentric, where they have a main employment centre um, located in the central business district to where people commute. Um, commuting costs then are a function of distance and housing costs will be higher at the centre because it's obviously more desirable to have a lower commute, a shorter commute, and then um, housing costs then inc uh, decrease with distance. Um, population also decreases, so you have more people situated closer to the CBD. And then the idea of, I suppose, related to this topic is the housing consumption, which is typically the inverse of population density. So that is that houses are smaller at the centre compared to the periphery. Um, and then uh, why cities, there's a, a hierarchy of cities, which is used to explain city size. So is agglomeration a cause or a consequence of large cities? So this is the, the study areas, the Dublin FUA, the uh, Dublin Functional Urban Area. So it's uh, defined using the EU OECD definition of cities, um, where an area is defined as within the FUA, 15% of its 
residents work inside the city core. So um, on the map here, I've shown a number of different definitions that exist for Dublin. Um, but the one I'll be using is the, the light shade of blue, which is the, um, the Urban Atlas FUA, which also corresponds with the, the counties of Mead, Kildare, Wicklow and Dublin. Um, so this is um, what it approximates to. So they've they've kind of just expanded it to, I suppose, simplify it so that it won't um, change over time. So the, the property data I used, um, I collected listings in May 2021 from DAF.ie. Um, listings are now, now show a, a meter squared, so it's possible to um, calculate a, a price per meter squared. Um, previous to this, it was um, it wasn't there wasn't any publicly available data. There might have been data in terms of um, BER ratings and but our other administrative data, but none of this was available publicly. So I scraped from uh, DAF.ie and um, using the address string, then geocoded the addresses. Um, listings then were filtered based on those that had a size and also um, a location within the Dublin functional urban area. Um, so this is uh, this shows all the, the points, the listings that I have. And I used a Krieging methodology to interpolate the value of houses between the points. So the pattern of um, house prices is not random. It's a function of, in this case, distance to the city centre or um, distance to some other type of amenity. Um, and the monocentric pattern for Dublin, a similar pattern was found in terms of rinse and commuting distance. Um, so I've estimated price per, per square metre at a point. Um, I then attached a, a variogram which gives listings near to the point of which I'm examining a greater influence compared to ones further away. So the, the influence of um, points declines with distance and there's a point at which they're no longer related. And um, uh, for, I suppose, more details on that, I've covered it in more detail in the paper. So this is the, the result then of the, the Krieging methodology is this um, price per square meter, which I've estimated. Um, so you can see that it's highest in the city centre around the central business district, which I used as the GPO. And it corresponds with what we see in um, urban economic theory, higher in the centre and then decreasing as we move further out. So although, and I suppose the one of the issues with previous um, listings was that if you look at even on uh, price register or um, DAF.e at the moment, there might be higher list prices in um, Kalini or other areas, but due to the size of the property, they'll typically have a lower price per square meter compared to CBD locations where there might be a, where the properties are typically smaller. And then you see a, a large a, a sharp drop off in prices beyond the the M50 there, which is the pink the pink roads. Um, and this is um, a method to, for, I suppose, further enhance it and include more characteristics is to use um, a spatial regression. So that's something I plan on looking at in the future. So um, just to recap, I suppose, what's publicly available and why this would be an enhancement. Um, the property price register is final sales price, but no detail on size. Um, DAF.E is sales listings, BR rating. However, it's list and not necessarily sales price. And then the CSO has a median or mean sales price with no detail on size. And we know that property is not homogenous across space. So an average property in D1 would be considerably smaller compared to an average property in uh, the air code A96 or rural areas. So this makes it very difficult then for um, both buyers and sellers to accurately value a property without the 
price per meter squared information. So this is why it's needed to be publicly available, preferably at a small area level. So future steps will, in this case, will be to consider additional characteristics, BER rating, which would be a proxy for the quality of the building. Um, use spatial regression to estimate local level coefficients. And then based on the characteristics of the property you're, you're looking at, you're thinking about um, buying or selling, it's possible to accurately estimate the market value of that. And I suppose other approaches would be to um, combine with costs to assess vi viability. Um, also add, add additional various, such as amenities, um, greater number of points, and then determine appropriate scale of analysis. So um, the frequency of sales will be important there so that you don't have, um, I suppose, a lot of fluctuating in the, the price per meter squared. Um, I suppose using this then, I've um, applied the price per square meter to look at affordability. So I use the, the 30, 40 affordability benchmark. Um, so 30% of household income on housing costs and look at the 40th percentile of household incomes on the income distribution. So the current um, Central Bank of Ireland mortgage rules uh, is three and a half times loan to income to gross income. However, there's no living space requirement. Um, the analysis here uses a 25 year 3% fixed term mortgage and an 80% loan to value. Um, I've increased the cost to 35% based on the, the kind of the high, the high increase in costs over the last number of years. And I examined the 30th, 40th and 50th percentiles of gross income and a range of dwelling sizes to cover um, a range of bedrooms and also then um, typical house size depending on urban versus rural. So uh, this is the 40th income percentile and 35% of costs. And we can see that based on income levels within the greater Dublin area, within the city core itself, um, it's 41 to 74 meters squared is the typical size that's affordable to people that are on this um, level on the income distribution. Uh, we can see then affordability increases with distance to the CBD so that people can um, afford to live in larger housing. I suppose that probably meets their housing needs more. Um, and one of the issues at the, at the moment um, is that there's no minimum required living space so that space requirements are determined rather by income and affordability and not by household size and actual need. So I've just outlined some house size scenarios here using um, an equivalent scale. So one for the first member, 0 0.7 for the second member and 0 0.5 for each child. And assume then that people need 45 meters squared of space. Um, we can see that for one person household, if they were to buy a 45 meter squared apartment, they would need an income, gross income of 54,000. And you can see that rapidly ramps up as the household size increases. Um, I suppose one solution or potential solution to this is to uh, introduce a, a national register of primary addresses. So there's nothing at the moment preventing a two, three or four person household from purchasing and living in a 45 meter square dwelling. Um, but it would be possible then to limit the number of persons that can use um, at least a, pri a primary residential address based on a unique identifier. It's then easy to identify vacant, underutilized or overcrowded properties. And similar systems exist in Belgium and Luxembourg. Um, I suppose in terms of demographic trends, we see this in terms of the, the overcrowding that currently exists within the greater Dublin area. Um, between the 2011 and 2016 census, we saw the first increase in national household size in almost 50 years. 
Um, Kildare, Meads, South Dublin, Fingal are now all above three. Uh, but household size didn't, in fact, decrease in predominantly rural counties. Um, and in terms of the backlog, then um, there's potentially 110,000 households short within Dublin as a result of lack of affordable supply. Um, and particularly a shortage of one to two bedroom dwellings. If we look at the percentage that live in apartments in Dublin, it's typically 19% in 2011, whereas up to 58% in Copenhagen. And then in terms of one person households, we also see a disparity there between Dublin and Copenhagen. So is it necessarily the case that Dublin actually has um, less one person households than Copenhagen? Or is it more a fact of lack of supply? Um, so in terms of quantifying that from the, the census, I've um, looked at um, two family households, house shares, and then people who are living with family and non-related households. And if we look at that, there's a potentially a backlog of 110,000 in, in addition to um, the need each year for um, new household formation. So there's clearly a an, an overcrowding issue around the, um, the greater Dublin area, which is, I suppose, a consequence of lack of supply and uh, reduced affordability. So in terms of density and heights, so how does the density of Dublin compare to the rest of Europe? Um, I use um, Urban Atlas data, which is from the EU Copernicus for 2012. Um, the height data is also from Urban Atlas and is at a 10 meter resolution. This is only available, however, for capital cities. And then population, I use a geostack grid to be consistent and downscale it based on the land use class from Urban Atlas. Um, I use radial analysis then in terms of taking the CBD and drawing concentric circles around it and measure the land use share within each ring. Um, I only consider urban fabric land uses and uh, for floor area, I assume each, each floor is approximately three meters in height. Um, scaling is then used to enable comparisons between cities of different sizes. So uh, I rescale both density and distance based on population size and the scaling laws derived by Lemoy and Crusoe. Um, so they found that population density um, scales in a homothetic manner. So that is that population density is proportional to the cube root of total population. So uh, these are heights for Dublin and Vienna. So they're both at the same scale. Uh, two kilometers there, you can see the bar down the bottom. And we can see that just a, a quick um, glance, you can see there's considerably more five to nine story buildings in Vienna compared to Dublin, even within the, the urban core itself. Um, so some of the population density measures I look at, um, I look at population density, so that looks at total area, net population density, which just looks at the, the building footprint, so just the ground building footprint, and then height population density, which includes the total floor area. So the first one is population density. Um, so just the, the top one there just shows that um, the share of artificial land covered by soil sealing in Dublin is roughly around the European average. You can see it's not too dissimilar to the other cities, Vienna, Copenhagen, Paris or Belfast. In contrast, then, when we look at population density rescaled, so just how to read these graphs, the distance R is the, the rescaled distance. So it's 10 kilometers um, Paris. So at 10 kilometers Paris, um, the density is approximately 10,000 inhabitants per kilometer for Copenhagen. 
and then slightly around 6,000 for Vienna. Where we can see that for Dublin, it has a lower population density around the core compared to the other cities. Um, if we look then at net population density, so only looking at uh, building floor area, so the ground floor area, um, we can see that Dublin also is also an outlier here. So um, there are it's far more people, um, I suppose, living per square, per kilometer square of artificial land use in uh, Vienna, Copenhagen and Paris compared to Dublin. Um, and then if we look at the flow area then, so this includes height and also the urban fabric, we can see that um, the population density of Dublin actually increases. So what this, what this is um, suggesting is that in Dublin is not as high, it's as artificialized as other cities, but because it's not as high, there's only so many people that can actually fit in the city compared to um, Vienna or Paris, where there's far more living space. Vienna, in fact, has probably the, the most, has more space than the other cities per person. So how they've managed to, um, I suppose, increase their population within the core is by providing um, a high quantity of living space. So just to quantify that, if Dublin was to reach the, the population density of Vienna in this case, they would need an extra 10 kilometers squared of floor area within four kilometers of the city center. And in terms then of mean building heights, this is um, the, I've looked at the, the mean height, so only looking at um, cells that are um, artificialized and that are uh, typically for residential or mixed, mixed use. We can see that Dublin is on average two meters below that of Copenhagen. So these distances then aren't rescaled, so they're actual distances. And in terms of um, maybe in terms of maximum building heights, we can also see that Dublin is below. So there aren't, um, I suppose, outlier buildings that are of um, ex extreme heights within Dublin compared to other cities. Um, so there's an, there's an opportunity cost then attached to that, to the inefficient use of city centre land. You see households displaced. And if you look at uh, for Vienna, 30% of its FUA population live within four kilometers compared to just 15% for Dublin. So what are the challenges? How can we improve the, the urban core density? So the, um, the current draft of the Dublin City Development Plan is currently under public consultation. So they state the, they have a default height of six stories, which is 18 meters. Um, they've also added in some um, details in terms of appropriate height or regard to existing neighborhoods. And then in contrast to that, if we look at the Vienna Urban Development Plan, they've set more, um, I suppose, clear guidelines in terms of uh, net floor space ratios. They've defined um, what's high rise versus high building. And then better use, mixed use, where the lower floors are used for retail and public uses and the importance of green space. So I think it's important to, to have a, a, a European perspective in terms of what, what can we learn from other cities such as Vienna or Copenhagen in terms of how to, to better plan this, the city for the future, not just for the next six to seven years, but for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, one of the current challenges in terms of the cost of delivery of apartments. Um, so the SCSI has a report out pub published in 2021 on the costs. So this was informed by 9,500 apartment units that were built in the year 2020. And 
uh, for category three medium rise, the range goes from 261 to 310,000 for a, a one bedroom apartment. And um, for a category four then, which is medium to high rise, 271 to 329. Um, and also one of the issues with apartment development, it requires significant upfront investment. There's high break even sales prices, which may not exceed the market price for an existing house or apartment. And there's no clear, obvious exit strategy with a high degree of risk attached. Um, I suppose that's probably one of the reasons why the, the build to rent model is one of the few models which can, which is building apartment units. They're operating on a different time horizon compared to owner occupiers. Um, whereas a, an investment fund is typically looking at uh, 50 to 60 year on their return, an owner occupier is looking at a mortgage of 20 to 25 years. Um, in terms of apartments and apartments activated, we can see that planning permissions are not tra translating into completions. So it's not necessarily, maybe the, the issue isn't necessarily permissions, but more viability. Um, I suppose one way to potentially improve this is to for the state to um, provide an intervention in terms of bridge the gap between viability and affordability to establish a state-owned fund to forward finance apartments, so sell subsidised apartments to owner occupiers um, with a preemptive right attached, so that the person um, never they kind of they're buying a security of tenure as opposed to um, property deeds. Um, this would cater to first time buyers and also remove them by removing them from the market and easing pressure on prices and then provide long term security of tenure. Um, it's also then providing the state with an asset and one that they can use to um, forward finance further new schemes. And then in terms of um, what will our cities look like in the future? So the NPF is currently based on um, patterns pre-COVID, so five days a week commuting, um, concentrating of populations into city centres and a decrease in the share of housing built outside of the four cities. Um, a recently published OECD report looked at um, what will be our city scenarios and they've outlined four potential scenarios for cities so the business as usual so the, our current um the current scenario um the cbd remains relevant but still more teleworking opportunities the second one is the intermediate cities where firms establish satellite offices um we've seen this already with um bank of ireland op opening up Co -work, our working spaces outside of Dublin. Um, this is potential for firms to reduce their presence in the central business district in um, areas where office rents are lower. The donut effect, which would, as the fringe distance increases, um, commuting distance also increases, and the CBD becomes less about less of a place of work and more a place of consumption. So in terms of uh, services, bars, restaurants, shopping, um, and then by by moving out into the suburbs, there's potential there to have an increase in housing affordability. And the final one is the the city paradox, where workers leave cities entirely in favour co-working spaces in tourist and other areas as their workplaces. So choosing areas where there's a high amenity value. So in conclusion, then. Um, the price per meter squared provides a simplified measure to both buyers and sellers. It can be used to compare properties between each other, um, compare building costs and the market price to assess viability. It should also then incorporate um, other household characteristics such as the BER rating, the site area, the property type, the number of bedrooms, um, and that should improve the accuracy and reduce the sensitivity 
to outliers. Um, then the relationship between size and affordability. So there are currently no space requirements per inhabitant. People are potentially trading off, um, are potentially trading off uh, affordability with size to determine their their um, their size requirements. They're also then trading off less space for affordability, or trading off um, large longer commuter distances. Um, income is potentially determining the size requirements in high demand areas such as Dublin, where there's a low supply as, as well. And then a register of addresses may be required to address some of the overcrowding issues I covered. Um, so in comparison to European capitals, Dublin is a low density, low rise city. Um, house shares are potentially substituting for a lack of apartments. Um, and there's potential there to learn from other European urban development, such as the development plans of Vienna and Copenhagen. Um, if we were to, to look at a target of floor area to reach the levels of Copenhagen, this would require Dublin to increase its floor space within the core by 30% or equivalent to around 100,000 apartments. Um, there's currently a high quantity of inactive planning permissions, uh, possibly more reasons or investigation there as to why these aren't being activated is to do with costs, design of the, the scheme for which the planning permission is available, financing or risk. And then state intervention is probably required to increase density in the city centre and suburbs. Um, it may be the case that the, the state has to establish a fund to forward finance apartments, more ambition, more ambitious state provision of apartments in the in the city centre. Then finally, then uh, what will the future of Dublin be? Um, possibly a greater mix required of one and two bed apartments. Um, definition needed of the urban core suburbs and then satellite settlements. So mixed use, high buildings required in the urban core with the help of state funding to bridge viability issues. Um, innovative typologies to achieve density in the suburbs. So um, there was a an example there by Shea Cleary Architects of how to achieve that. And then standard housing is more affordable to provide in um, satellite settlements where there isn't the need for um, cores and other uh, structural requirements needed for apartments. So the hybrid working model then may offer a kind of a, a solution to the crisis in terms of the attractiveness of satellite settlements over suburbs. People are possibly willing to trade off longer commutes, less frequent for lower housing costs and larger housing. And then to, to I suppose, improve quality of life, more plans around how we want our green spaces, parks and playgrounds, particularly in satellite towns, should be provided to um, for future generations. So um, I'd like to thanks thanks for your attention, and um, uh, any questions. Well, thank thank you very much. I'm going to open it up um, for questions. We in the in the Barrington format we have no official discussions, but our honorary secretary is somewhat of a an expert in this topic. So I'm going to ask uh, Ronan Lyons maybe to give some initial observations, and please then put up your hand or in the chat box, and I'll bring other questions on. Well done, Paul. Thank you, Danny, and, and thank you, Paul, um, for um, a really interesting talk. Um, probably no surprises that you had me at, uh, at, from the very start to the very end. Um, the, the three elements that I, I, I wanted to, um, I suppose, follow up on, the, the first was in relation to the, the analysis of housing prices. Um, and did you have any particular strategy for handling missing square meters or did you just did you just drop them? Perhaps more substantively, price per square meter is really useful when we're thinking about apartments. It becomes a lot more complicated when we think about 
houses, which of course brings in, in the later parts of your analysis, um, because you've also got a square meterage of land as well as a square meterage of, of, of floor space. Um, so it might be something to think about how we, uh, as we transition as a society to, to, to have more price per square meter metrics, how we do that in a system which is dominated by houses in a way that's meaningful for, um, for, for consumers. I thought the affordability exercise was really useful. I really liked the, um, the, the way of thinking about that, going a certain fraction of peak and distribution and, and showing what the maximum square meter which you can afford um, and doing that for different household types. Um, it's, it, it, it highlights the, the, the really important link between housing supply and, and, and household formation, which I think a lot of, um, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna single anyone out, but I, I think some have been trying to ignore that for the past 10 years and, and assume that the increase in, in household size 2011 to 2016 um, is some reflection of unusual preferences, whereas we need a reflection of a failure of, of housing supply. Um, and that's, I think, with the density, uh, the third thing I wanted to, um, to compliment, uh, I wrote down in my notes here, it's a real tour de force of facts and simple facts, and they're indisputable. And um, they dispel a lot of myths um, about Dublin's density. And again, you hear people arguing that Dublin's perfectly fine on density, there's nothing wrong, um, but metric after metric, I think um, you, you show that's not the case. Um, I, I, I suppose, uh, one thing I wanted to ask was, what, 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 what are the top two or three things? I mean, you did, you did address some of these that we, we might learn from the systems in place in other cities that, are, that facilitate height. Um, I know you kind of had the Dublin versus Vienna example, but I wonder if you had any more on that in terms of how we enable height. I mean, it's more of a political question, I guess. Um, and then lastly, will you be submitting something to the Dublin City Council development? And plan and really be submitting something to the Housing Commission. Um, I'd, uh, I'd strongly recommend that, um, that you do, even if it's just this lecture. Um, so really, um, we don't have a formal um, proposal of thanks, but I'd certainly like to propose that we, we thank Paul for his, his, his part of lecture. And with that, I'll, I'll hand back to the Chair. Great, thank you, uh, Ronan. Uh, Donal O'Brolicon, uh, Donal, I don't know if you want to come on, maybe uh, Chris could allow you on there just you're talking about the importance of the amenity values if you'd like to come on screen Donald or would you like me to just read it in I'll ask Chris to bring Donald on if he wishes to do so but Paul your initial responses to Ronan's comments yeah um I suppose one of the one of the next steps would be to um to kind of go beyond price, per, just a simple metric of um, size and price and move towards including more um, BR rating and then separate out um, apartments from houses. So I think um, possibly to look at using the, the RMF from the CSO, which looks at the, the residential property prices where they've linked um, the property price register and BR rating data. So I think they've um, probably more data over a longer period of time, which might be able to give us some kind of um, handle on the price per for, of apartments. Because I suppose one of the one of the issues with apartments is the the low frequency outside of cities. You see, um, just beyond outside of Dublin really there just isn't pr probably sufficient quantity to um, give an estimate. Um, in terms of the what we can learn from other um, what other cities I think one of the I suppose one of the one of the obvious um, observations would be that it's it could possibly be um, a number of historic reasons as to why uh, Dublin isn't as as high in comparison to Vienna or Paris. Um, if you look at the, uh, just looking at some new developments within Vienna, a lot tend to be um, kind of refurbishments of existing buildings that were already um, six, seven stories high and um, built around 1910. And if you look at within Dublin city itself, 
50% of the, the building, the current um, households or housing units were built prior to 1980. So there's probably issues there in terms of um, space, um, existing dwellings, low density, and uh, then at the same time, attempting to build um, apartments to a high standard where the, the prices are potentially, the costs are potentially higher as well. Great, thanks Paul. I, I see Donald has joined us there. Donald, if you wanna come on camera to uh, ask your question. Uh, Paul, Anybody else, put up your hand, Paul, please. Paul, you mentioned amenity. Uh, you mentioned stress green space in Vienna and you mentioned amenity outside the Dublin core for the suburban areas. Why don't you apply the same perspective to the Dublin core area? I want to give you a little bit of background. About 35 years ago, I live in Drumcondra, about 35 years ago, a bunch of residents associations here realized that a lot of the privately owned land, then mainly in religious hands, was going to be sold. We went to city council and asked them to prepare a development plan for the area uh, long before there were local area plans and they refused. They said that they were concentrating at that time in the inner city inside the canals. Nothing has changed in the last 35 years, but they did suggest to us that we do it ourselves. So we did. We hired our own town planner, paid for it ourselves, didn't get any money from the state. And one of the points we mentioned, we were concerned about traffic, won't go into that, but one of the other issues we mentioned was this religious owned land. And he, this planner suggested to us, look, he said, if you want more public open space, the way to go to it is for higher density. And we looked at him and he said, well, don't knock it. I said, we're not knocking it. He said, um, the reciprocal of higher density is more public open space. So we said, that's grand. And we presented this plan to the city council, a lot of other public authorities. The first two properties that came in under the then residential density guidelines produced by another economist in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, which were gated communities with no public open space. So, and even still, the current city council are still focused on the inner city. And if you look at things that the inner city, the city council and the public authorities have done, take the docklands, there isn't a blade of grass being put in there at all. No amenities whatsoever. And you compare that to D2, where there's a new public park, the city council are trying to get a hold of, of uh, Fitzwilliam Square, but not in, not in the real, Central Business District, which is part of D1 down, down the old Docklands. And that, so do you have any, how, how do you view amenity value or do you care about it at all? Paul, over to, over to you, Paul. Um, I think one of the, I can just I'll probably just highlight a map here. Um, can I share my screen? Chris, you might let Francis Ruan in as well while we're looking yeah, at it. I, I didn't um, talk about this during the presentation, but this is a um, this is a map of um, non-built up Greenland within within Dublin. So these are two, five, ten. Um, I think probably one of the challenges at the minute in terms of providing green space in the the urban core is that the majority of the land is already artificialized and with buildings um, already there. Um, so it becomes probably very difficult for to provide, but I would agree that um, by building denser um, within cities or building higher, it, incre it, it frees up more space for public parks and public spaces. And it's probably something that um, hasn't been done over time. Thanks, Paul. Um, Francis, you're, you're on there if you want to come on camera. Yeah, yeah, just to, um, uh, just, uh, just a couple of questions. Thank you very much for the paper. It's absolutely fascinating to see it. And I'm just very struck by the most recent comment you made there. Somebody said to me many years ago that Dublin had touched quite a lot of spaces that were very, um, 
uh, that were very, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, that, you know, green spaces within the city, the city range. But actually, when you take out the Phoenix Park, you realise that just the concentration is there. So there's a sense in which the average for the whole city looked much better than the reality for most sections of the cities. And, and Paul's uh, chart really showed that, his map really showed that very clearly. I had just two thoughts with regard to questions for, for Paul. He focused on the Dublin-Vienna comparison. And I'm wondering, is that mirrored for other European cities he looked at? And I'm just partly thinking that Vienna was built as the capital city of an empire. Uh, and I just think that that might have, some, have had some effect there. I'm just wondering, did the other cities, did it look again, did the results stand up to the, for the other cities? And then the other thing that struck me, which might be relevant, let's say, to Copenhagen, is that geography ha might have an impact on how we manage this, because we have the sea on one side of the city. And that really means that, that, that there's at least some proportion of the land within a range, if you want to be a given distance from the central business district, is going to be in, 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 as it were, in the water. So there's a sense in which the issue, I'm just wondering, would you agree that the issue for a city like Dublin is, is probably even more challenging in relation to managing height if you believe you want people to be within uh, a shorter distance of the central business district? Thank you. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, um, thanks, Francis. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the comparisons, um, I mainly used uh, Vienna, Copenhagen and Paris, largely to do with there were Western European cities and um, I had the, the heights available. Um, and it's something I've, I can look at in the future in terms of um, artificial land use and population density that there might indeed be um, maybe s small to mid-size um, cities that are probably more comparable with Dublin. Um, in response to the, the sea, um, we definitely see this in terms of um, artificial land use or artificial land take. Um, when you extract out the, the water and look at the, the share of the, the residual that's covered by um, soil sealing, you see that coastal cities tend to be um, highly urbanized or highly artificialized compared to um, non-coastal cities. I suppose that the, the extreme example is um, Venice or Cadiz, where uh, they are extremely restricted in terms of um, their typologies. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think there's, pro there's probably more um, work to be done in terms of um, uh, comparisons and trying to, I suppose, find cities and cities and areas that are uh, similar to Dublin where we could learn some examples and learn some case studies that can be applied. Thank you. Great, thanks, Francis. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, anybody else? No. Um, Paul, Teddy, would you we have two, two hands there. Oh, sorry, I'm not seeing the hands. Apologies. Fionn and, and Patrick and Mary Dorn as well. Okay, sorry. My... Patrick, do you want to come on there? Yes. Yes, hi. Thank you. Very, very interesting paper. And I just, um, it gets away from the quantitative area, but I was wondering whether Paul had any sense about the interaction between uh, the, the planning of, uh, of Vienna and Dublin, for example, to take the two comparisons, and the implementation of that planning, and to what... Uh, We've seen a number of instances in recent times where the outline plan for Dublin is, is uh, overturned by appeals to the, the uh, board planola. I can imagine that that might that creates an, a, a, new, a new incentive for developers to pitch uh, for projects which are inconsistent with the outline plan, but they think might get through anyway. And, and it is the, uh, the developer planner relationship in a city like Vienna and maybe the other cities that he studied is it is it more um, predictable so that once the plan is there, uh, developers will only design 
schemes that are consistent with that plan, and then you might get more coherence of the overall um, and, and speed with which the uh, uh, developments occur. Thanks, Patrick. Paul? Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure um, how, how the, I suppose, the implementation has worked to date in the, for example, Vienna. Um, it's probably one thing I'd like to look at next because the, um, the, the, the latest Vienna development plan was launched in 2014. It's possible to look at how that has progressed over the last six, seven years and whether they has, whether it has achieved what it's, what it's stated, um, what it's stated out to achieve at the start, the beginning, um, I suppose another, another useful example was the I came across an example in Hanover in Germany where they they applied a, um, a kind of a master plan back in the year 2000 around um, how they wanted to develop the city for future where they um, I think the the politicians at the time um, uh, voted in a, a kind of a, I suppose gave more um, power to the to the planners to I suppose enforce more probably probably unpopular um, decisions rather than um, I suppose enforce more unpopular decisions that might necessarily get through if um, that might make voters unhappy. Thanks, Paul. I Thanks. see Sean Barrett there. Do you want Chris to let Sean in? And uh, I think Donald came back just making a point in chat there about. Brownfield sites um, being in Dunleary, uh, rat down the use of brownfield sites back into urban spaces. If that's a phenomenon that's across other cities, Paul, that you might co want to comment on. And Nono Gorman's coming in as well. So Sean first and then no. Sean, you'll need to unmute, please. Sean is still muted. We might jump to Noel there if you can unmute Noel. Let's see if we can get Sean back in. Go ahead, Noel. This is probably as good a time as any for me to say that if, if anyone doesn't get a chance for whatever reason, technological or other, not to contribute, you can do so by sending me an email to secretary at sissy.ie. Um, and all contributions will go into the journal um, after Paul's contribution, after Paul's paper, um, and we'll have all of the, the, um, the contributions. Um, no, it looks like he's unmuted, but I don't know if he's able to. And Sean is now unmuted as well. Have a go there, Sean, so you can hear you. Uh, thank you very much, Danny, and thanks to Paul for the paper. Just some of the thoughts. There's a kind of a hole in the CBD uh, quite near the GPO. Uh, so that's just a question, is, it, is that the CBD or are we building new uh, complexes around the M50 in particular as you head south? Uh, so that's just a point. The other is, does Paul have thoughts on the influence of all of this, of what uh, Deeper has shown to be uh, quite a low productivity, high cost construction sector? That we've got in Ireland. The, the build report showed it had an increased productivity for some decades and was very low by European standards. And then the, the, the other thought is the use of the bar ratings. What exactly uh, do they mean? I'm conscious of talking to people who say they've spent an immense amount of money uh, with grants trying to increase the bar ratings and it doesn't seem to work out. Uh, so you know, should you buy an extra pullover or have a glass of whiskey, which will put some money into the exchequer rather than looking for something? But but is 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 the bar scheme uh, uh, working? But uh, you know, it's thanking Paul because we need to do a lot more thinking. I think we have a problem uh, in construction uh, uh, in Ireland. Is it because we're an island? Uh, I saw a program on BBC Northern Ireland a while ago that houses on on vehicles were brought in from Vienna and were cheaper to build in 
Northern Ireland than anything on the island of Ireland. So uh, they, they, you know, the work that Ronan has pioneered has so many uh, uh, aspects of the sector in which we have a problem. And is that why in the National Development Plan we're spending 5% of GNI when virtually all the rest of the European Union gets by on three? Uh, but thanking Paul and th those are thoughts not as focused as he's heard from the other speakers, but I think we, we opening out the construction topic is a, an important work of the society this afternoon. And I'm grateful to the committee and to Paul for that. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, Noel, I don't know if you can uh, come in now. Barry Kelleher will we'll bring in as well, Barry, if you're ready to. Uh, Noel? We're not hearing you, Noel. Try it again there. You just, yeah. Sorry, Noel, we don't seem to be able to pick you up. Um, Chris, I don't know if you've let Barry in there. Paul, do you want to come back on anything that you've heard from Sean? Yeah, from Donal on the brand side. I suppose just to um to talk about the um I think what Sean was uh, talking about there is in terms of um the monocentric versus polycentric type cities. Um I think even even if you look at um in terms of population density, the the, the kind of the historic urban center still is usually st still remains the the dominant center in terms of the in relation to the other uh, polycentric nodes and um, in terms of the BR rating it was something I used to um, to measure housing quality um, in terms of age or age of the building or how well kept it was um, so that was kind of one of the main reasons why I looked at uh, BR rating. Great, thank you. Barry, um, do you want to come on? Noel, you might type in your question if that helped. And uh, Mary Doyle, we might bring in as well. So Barry, up first. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, my question was regarding the maximum height uh, restrictions in Dublin City. There's been some court cases between the Borpalala and Dublin City in the past they both seem to have a different idea of what the maximum height should be allowed. And there is a consultation going on, but I was just wondering, do you think they actually will increase the maximum height restriction going forward in, in the middle of a housing crisis? I mean, the government has an objective and there are two of the bodies that are in charge of helping to supply housing, but they seem to be in different uh, meanings of what the legislation means and what they would like going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. And Mary, would you like to come on as well? Thanks, Danny. Yes, um, and thanks very much for a very interesting presentation. I arrived a bit late, so hopefully this hasn't been addressed. But I was just wondering, have things like wars and history anything to do with Dublin's density? I mean, some of the other cities that were mentioned, just well, it's Vienna, Paris, probably had to be rebuilt after World War. So, you know, they came at a fresher time than us. So we left our historical buildings in place more so than the others who were just had to do a quick rebuild or redesign of the, the cities. So did that have an impact, the fact that we were less damaged by wars? Thank you. Great, thanks, Mary. Back to you, Paul. Um, yeah, I might just address Mary's question first. Um, um, it's not something that I've examined in terms of um, wars or how much was how much of a city was destroyed after a world war but um i know having looked at um artificial land use share you definitely see similarities between um kind of established eu member states that were founders such as um the benelux countries france and germany and then uh, dublin or Ireland, the UK, and uh, Denmark, and then you see also see then similarities between the the new EU member states which joined in the expansion in two thousand four. Um, but I think possibly some more research required there in terms of um, the explaining the the historic differences, and and in terms of the 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 building heights question. Um, I don't know is the, I suppose the, 
the straightforward answer. Um, um, I know just looking at the from the from the data that I looked at, um, it was it, it just becomes clear that um, as as a city, Dublin is um, clearly well below that of other um, I suppose established e EU cities, and in terms of Dublin, one would like to become um, a kind of a, a major. EU city alongside um, Milan or Munich, um, how much by not going high enough, how much could that potentially um, have an impact? So that's probably something that you want to be examined. Thanks, Paul. No, those questions, Paul, um, or your views on Dublin's unique governance with the, floor, with the four planning entities, each with an incentive to favour revenue generating use of land, and particularly, you know, four um cbds in a single modest city yeah um i suppose i'm not um it wouldn't be my area of expertise in terms of um planning and local governments um, um it probably would i don't i'm not entirely sure how the the other cities work they normally have a um Maybe an overarching development plan, but they probably then have um, a, a municipality at a at a lower level. Um, so it might be I I probably have to look more closely to see what they do in in other cities. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, Donald's given us an update there just on the Borpanola, Dunleary, Ratdown County Council, and some of the planning. Um, appeals on the commercial industrial land. So that's a good piece of background information what he's talking about. So, Paul, I think it's given that time of the evening, you, you listed a quite a lot of responses and I think a very worthy winner of the Barrington Medal. Uh, you, as you've demonstrated tonight, I think in the tradition of Barrington, the social inquiry couldn't be any more topical for uh, for Irish society right now, the topic, and, you, and as, as Ronan said at the start, you brought very simple facts and you know, uncontroversial facts together in a very, very persuasive way. With you know, um, you made it sound easy, but we all know what you actually brought together there is actually very difficult to do. So I think that's a great testimony to uh, to your, the clarity of your thinking and your exposition. So congratulations um, on the Barrington. I see Ronan there. Do you want to come back in, honorary secretary? Um, yes, it was just to say that um, the society has moved into the 2020s with a new website. Um, so um, I would encourage all the, the members and indeed visitors today to, to check out the site. And we'll be using that site and our mailing list to get in touch in relation to our next event, um, which will be held in, in March. And more details of that will, will follow in due course. And of course, um, we would encourage submissions. So if anyone wants to um, have a piece of work published, uh, in our journal and of course presented at a meeting and um, please do get in touch secretary at city.ie or indeed on our website and all those who contributed today we have the recording which will go live on our youtube channel and later on our website and um, but i might follow up with a couple of you in relation to your contributions to make sure they're accurately reflected in the journal uh, and uh, just echo danny's thanks to, to paul and congratulations on the medal. paul the last word to you if you want to finish up yeah, thank, um, thanks very much. And um, thanks very much to everyone for attending. And um, I hope you um, enjoyed the presentation. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to email me. Great. Thanks, Paul. Bye, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, Chris.